This presentation is for informational purposes only. It does not replace a consultation with a board-certified plastic surgeon. These examples are shown merely to illustrate certain principles. Your results may be better or worse than those shown. The information presented here is incomplete. Before making any medical or surgical decision, rely upon an in-person consultation with a surgeon of your choice. gave me part of my life back that was missing before the surgery, so um, I'm really grateful that I had it. I wouldn't have changed a thing. I'm stress-free. I know I'm not going to get breast cancer. Life after having the transplant reconstruction surgery is great. It's more than a physical change because you, you get an emotional change too. Everything is back to normal and it really did not take long to bounce back. It's given me a renewed sense of self and um, I've never felt better in my life. I've never felt more alive, um, I've never felt more centered. I know that it's, it's scary making the, the decision um, to have um, reconstructive surgery, but it's, um, it's so worth what you get out of it. Life is more relaxed. I don't have to, you know, worry about um, what I wear or how I wear it. I feel more comfortable with myself, so I'm, I feel, have a little bit more confidence in myself. It just feels good to be able to get out there and go do the things that you like doing. And as soon as I had the surgery is the day I started feeling better. And it just got better from there. And it's gotten better and better and better. And I'm loving life. Life is good. Life and it is. is. It's very good. I have a renewed sense of hope that um, my life will continue to, to um, be active and I have a, a sense of hope for other women who are faced with the breast cancer diagnosis that um, this surgery and um, other types of reconstruction can help them to, to live normal lives. I embraced the mastectomy and reconstruction procedure and because of that I had a terrific outcome and it's changed my life in a positive way. This year, more than 200,000 women in this country will be diagnosed with breast cancer. For many of them, a mastectomy, or removal of the affected breast, will be recommended as part of the cancer treatment. Hello, I'm Dina Ruiz Eastwood. Welcome to Breast Reconstruction, Know Your Options. The idea of losing a breast to cancer can threaten a woman's self-esteem as well as her female identity. Well, fortunately, there are now several options for reconstruction, ranging from silicone implants to the use of her own tissue to reconstruct the affected breast. In this presentation, Dr. David Morwood, a plastic surgeon in Monterey, California, will discuss with us each method and how each method is used. Later, we'll have an opportunity to speak with women who chose different methods of reconstruction. We'll talk to experts in the field of breast cancer, and we'll let you know your options for breast reconstruction. And we're going to answer some of the most commonly asked questions about breast reconstruction. Thank you, Dina. As Dina implied, the idea of losing a breast for some women can be almost as difficult as being diagnosed with breast cancer. Modern breast reconstruction can help. To reconstruct a breast requires both an artistic and a scientific approach. It is challenging, rewarding, and most of all, can help a woman to feel whole again. Breast reconstruction is truly one of my favorite procedures in all of plastic surgery. The purpose of this presentation is to provide women with valuable information about the major issues in breast reconstruction. This DVD is designed for the woman who has had a mastectomy, a partial mastectomy, or a lumpectomy, 
or who will have one of those procedures in the future. Of course, this DVD does not replace a consultation with a board-certified plastic surgeon. However, we are confident that after viewing this presentation, you will be much better prepared for that consultation, and hence, a custom-designed surgical plan can be developed just for you. We've got a lot of material to cover, so let's get started. Breast reconstruction is a big topic. For most women, of course, this is unfamiliar territory. This DVD is organized by chapters. We welcome you to repeat chapters, to skip around, or to refer to sections that interest you most. Above all, take your time to review this presentation. No one would ever be expected to review this entire DVD in one sitting. The core information emphasizing the four major issues in breast reconstruction is summarized in the next chapter, a 10-minute summary. Some of you will want to schedule a consultation with a board-certified plastic surgeon after viewing this one chapter. Others will want to watch other sections. Either way, we are certain this information will help you to feel more comfortable while making important decisions about your care. In my office during the initial consultation, Women find it very helpful to organize their thoughts around the four major issues in breast reconstruction. Those four major issues are, number one, the type of breast reconstruction, number two, the contralateral or other side breast surgery, number three, the timing of breast reconstruction. We can start the breast reconstruction at the time of the mastectomy or in a delayed fashion. And number four, we can consider later nipple areola reconstruction. Let's start with number one, the type of breast reconstruction. There are three common methods of breast reconstruction that we offer today. Number one, implants and tissue expanders. Number two, latissimus flaps. And number three, abdominal flaps. Let's give an introductory look at number one, implants and tissue expanders. A reconstructive breast implant is a medical device placed under a woman's tissue to replace missing volume and influence the shape of the breast. Let's look at one patient example. This is a woman who elected to have delayed reconstruction with implants. She previously had a modified radical mastectomy, as is shown here. She was reconstructed with the placement of a breast implant. This provides volume, influences the shape of the breast, and gives her some symmetry. A tissue expander is a deflated water balloon placed in the operating room and then filled slowly after the operation to stretch the overlying skin. Here's another patient example. This woman elected to have immediate breast reconstruction using tissue expanders. This followed a skin sparing mastectomy. As we see here, she was met by the plastic surgeon before the operation and we planned an immediate breast reconstruction with tissue expanders. The tissue expander was placed in the operating room, filled up in the office, and then later the tissue expander was removed, an implant was placed, and she underwent nipple areola reconstruction. As we go through this presentation, you'll learn that there are pros and cons to every decision that we make in breast reconstruction. In summary, the advantage of implants and tissue expanders is it is simple, short surgery. The disadvantage is it's the use of a foreign material. Let's go on to the second type of breast reconstruction, latissimus dorsi flaps. Using tissue from the latissimus dorsi area that is located on the back and extends from the lower back up to the shoulder, we can use this valuable tissue to replace skin and to provide volume to reconstruct a breast. Here's a patient example. This woman elected to undergo immediate breast reconstruction using only the latissimus flap. She had what's called a skin sparing mastectomy. Here we see her about six weeks following the operation and here she is shown about three years later. Oftentimes, we will use the latissimus dorsi flap to transpose and place over a breast implant. Let's look at an example. In this next case, we did immediate breast reconstruction with a latissimus flap placed over an implant, again following a skin sparing mastectomy. The latissimus flap was transposed over a breast implant, providing volume and fair symmetry for the reconstructed breast. 
In summary, the latissimus dorsi flap has the advantage of being a reliable, dependable flap. The disadvantage is it leaves a permanent visible scar at the donor site. The third major way we do breast reconstruction is with the use of the abdominal tissue. This is commonly called the abdominal tram flap. There are multiple ways that we can use abdominal tissue to reconstruct the breast. We can leave it partly attached to the muscle, this is called a pedicle flap, or we can totally detach it from the body and use a microscope to hook the vessels back up. That's called a microsurgical free flap. Here's another patient example. This woman elected to have delayed breast reconstruction with an abdominal tram flap after her modified radical mastectomy. Here she is about six weeks following the abdominal tram flap. In this operation, we took tissue from the abdomen and transposed it up to the breast area to provide a symmetric breast mound. In summary, an abdominal tram flap provides a woman's own tissue to reconstruct her breast. The disadvantage, it's a longer, more complex surgery. That's a summary of the first of the four major issues in breast reconstruction. There are three common methods we offer for breast reconstruction. Number one, implants and tissue expanders. Number two, latissimus dorsi flaps. And number three, abdominal flaps. Each of these three methods has its own pros and cons. Please remember there is no perfect way to reconstruct a breast and a custom design surgical plan is developed for each woman. Before we go on to the second major issue in breast reconstruction, please keep in mind, regardless of the method chosen, breast reconstruction will generally require revisions to achieve optimal results. Let's go on to the second major issue in breast reconstruction, the contralateral or other side breast surgery. We offer the option of operations on the other breast to achieve symmetry. This can involve a breast reduction, a breast lift, or an augmentation. Let's look at an example. This woman underwent immediate breast reconstruction with a latissimus flap over an implant, and at the same time, we did a left augmentation for symmetry. Here she's seen preoperatively. There's some operative drawings. And here she's shown after the right breast reconstruction with the left breast augmented with an implant for symmetry. The third major issue in breast reconstruction to consider is timing. We can start the breast reconstruction at the time of the mastectomy or sometime in the future. This is called delayed breast reconstruction. Here's a case of delayed breast reconstruction with an abdominal flap. Let's look at an example of immediate breast reconstruction using the abdominal flap. This woman elected to undergo immediate breast reconstruction with her own abdominal tissue. This is called immediate breast reconstruction with an abdominal tram flap. Here she's shown before the operation with some operative markings. Here she is about seven weeks after immediate breast reconstruction using her own abdominal tissue. Here we see her nine months later and again three years after her operation. Here's the same woman seen before her operation and three years after her immediate breast reconstruction with her own abdominal tissue. Immediate breast reconstruction certainly offers some advantages. In summary, there's one less anesthetic, one less hospital stay, less psychological trauma, and fewer touch-ups are needed. However, there may be certain disadvantages to immediate breast reconstruction. It may be a longer operation, may increase the need for blood transfusion, it may be difficult to schedule multiple surgeries at one time. A woman may not know her first choice for breast reconstruction, and postoperative radiation may interfere with the reconstruction process. The fourth major issue for us to consider in breast reconstruction is later nipple areola reconstruction. There are three common methods that we use, grafts, flaps, and tattoos. They all share one characteristic in common, Nipple reconstruction is typically done at a later date. Let's look at another patient example. This woman underwent bilateral mastectomies with immediate breast reconstruction using abdominal flaps. She's shown about three months after her operation. She later underwent nipple areola reconstruction on both sides using flaps and grafts. 
and then later underwent tattooing. Once a woman becomes familiar with the four major issues in breast reconstruction, I recommend she start to ask herself four questions. Number one, what method is best for me? Number two, does my breast on the other side need surgery? Number three, when will my breast reconstruction be started? And number four, what method of nipple areolar reconstruction is best for me? For most women, of course, this is unfamiliar territory. My recommendation is that you review this chapter one, a 10 minute summary, until you're comfortable with the material. Then go on to the next chapter called an in-depth look. Please remember that a custom designed surgical approach is developed for every woman. No two women will make the same decision. There is not one single choice that is right for everyone. And as plastic surgeons, we want to work with you. We want to address your needs and develop a plan that is just right for you. This chapter is called An In-Depth Look. Here we'll go over four major issues in breast reconstruction, this time more closely. To review, those four major issues are, number one, the type of breast reconstruction, number two, the contralateral or other side breast surgery, Number three, we'll go over timing, whether or not to do breast reconstruction at the time of the mastectomy or in a delayed fashion. And number four, we'll go over later nipple areolar reconstruction. Let's review the four important questions for the woman interested in breast reconstruction. Number one, what method is best for me? Number two, does my breast on the other side need surgery? Number three, when will my breast reconstruction be started? Number four, what method of nipple reconstruction is most suitable for me? We'll start with number one again. What method is best for me? There really are three basic approaches to breast reconstruction. Implant alone, or more commonly, expander implant. Latissimus flap, which can be with or without an implant, with or without an expander, and then an implant. And then tram flap, and the latter can also have an implant in certain situations. The real key here is that there are three different basic options in terms of surgical approach that can be applied to each given patient. So the reconstruction is individualized based on the patient's needs and that gives us wonderful opportunity to work with patients to enhance their recovery and their rehabilitation after breast cancer treatment. Women are presented with a lot of information, have a lot of decisions to make, and at the end of the day, a woman should feel comfortable making a decision that is right for her. Let's start with number one, implants and tissue expanders. There are many different types of breast implants available. Some are filled with silicone, some are filled with saline or salt water. There are smooth covers, there are textured covers, some are round, some are teardrop shaped. There are many different options available and this allows the plastic surgeon to more closely match the desired breast shape and size. Let's look at a patient example. This woman underwent immediate breast reconstruction with implants immediately following her skin sparing mastectomy. We saw her in the office preoperatively and at the same time as her mastectomy she underwent placement of saline breast implants as shown here. That's the simplest form of breast reconstruction, the immediate placement of breast implants. Typically, however, in the reconstructive process where we intend to use breast implants, a tissue expander is used. A tissue expander essentially is a flat water balloon placed in the operating room under a woman's tissue. Later in the office, we start the inflation, and when the desired size and shape is obtained, we go back to the operating room, remove the tissue expander, and place a permanent implant. Let's look at a patient example. This woman underwent immediate breast reconstruction with a tissue expander placement followed by a silicone implant. She is shown here after her biopsy that showed left breast carcinoma. In the operating room, she underwent a mastectomy and a tissue expander was placed. The woman undergoes tissue expansion in the office. When the desired size is achieved, we go back to the operating room, the tissue expander is removed, and a permanent implant is placed. 
Following that process, or sometimes in the future, we can reconstruct the nipple areola complex. You will recall that there are many different sizes and shapes and types of breast implants available. Some are filled with silicone, some are filled with saline, some are smooth, some are textured. In general, most tissue expanders we use now have a textured surface. And of course, they come in many different sizes and shapes. This allows us to select the proper tissue expander to more closely match the opposite breast. As you can see here, this is an empty tissue expander, which essentially is a flat water balloon. This is an almost totally filled tissue expander. As you can see, the tissue expander adds volume and some shape to the reconstructed breast. The tissue expander is essentially a flat water balloon that is placed in the operating room under a woman's soft tissue. We allow that to heal for about two weeks, and then in the office we start the tissue expansion process. As you know, there are many different sizes and shapes of breast implants, and as we've demonstrated, there are many different sizes and shapes and textures of tissue expanders. What's key in the tissue expansion process is to locate the valve. I typically start out by feeling that firm metal valve, and of course I can feel it because the rest of the tissue expander is soft. I start out and I make a small mark with my surgical blue, it's a sterile marker. Then Ellie hands me the magnifinder, and I use this magnifinder to confirm the position of that metal valve. Then I change directions with the magnifinder, and what that does is allow me to confirm the position of the valve and we're right on right there. That's it. Now, of course, my trusty assistant, Ellie, will hand me an antiseptic solution. This is all sterile. It's all sterile saline. It's sterile salt water, sterile instruments, sterile procedure. Now that we know exactly where the valve is and we've prepared with an antiseptic solution with betadine, we can continue with the breast expansion process. And of course, our patient's awake, and she certainly seems to be relatively comfortable. How are we doing? Fine. Are you feeling any discomfort? No. And Ellie is right here with us. She is so good about helping patients to feel comfortable. Typically, a woman will undergo three, four, sometimes five expansions in the office. They're spaced one week apart or two weeks apart. And so we achieve the desired size quite quickly. And as we said, it can stretch the overlying skin in this case, stretch the overlying skin and the latissimus flap. Sometimes in the office we go a little bit larger than the desired size to stretch the overlying skin, that way it gives it a more mature look. And sometimes we go just to the size we need. At that point, a woman can choose between being converted to a saline implant or a silicone implant. So understandably, a woman is somewhat anxious during the first tissue expansion process here in the office. But routinely, women get used to it very quickly. They walk in and out, and they come in, as I said, for about three, four, perhaps five times. We do the expansion, and we're on our way. After undergoing expansion in the office, a woman has an opportunity to choose between a saline and a silicone implant. This can be an important decision for a woman to make in the breast reconstruction process. I pretty much made up my mind it was saline all the way. Um, Silicone, I just heard, I've heard too many bad things about it and not enough good, so uh, there's actually no decision. I just decided to saline. Now the silicone implant is made of a silicone rubber shell, and you can fill that either with, a, with saline or with a silicone jello-like material, silicone gel. And it's the silicone gel that's had the bad reputation. It is now the most studied material in medicine. There are at least 35 excellent studies all coming at it from different positions with close to a million women having been studied. And no one has ever come up with a cause and effect for silicone and disease. So silicone in itself will not make you ill. I use the analogy that Silicone implants to me are the BMW of, of breast implants, meaning performance, but safe, but performance. And our saline implants are more our Volvo, which is 
you know, prides itself on safety, but never quite the performance of the BMW. Beyond that, it becomes a very technical issue. So in a given patient, I might recommend a saline device or a silicone device, depending upon what I'm trying to accomplish. So I personally don't have a bias for one or the other at the moment. I try to pick the device that will solve the problem for a given patient. I'm really happy with my choice to go with the, um, the silicone implants. Um, they, I, they, I think they, they, they feel real, you know, and they make me feel real, um, more complete, and I'm, I'm really happy with that decision. Since a breast implant is a foreign material, it's possible in the early postoperative period to develop an infection. The second complication to specifically address regarding breast implant-based reconstruction is capsular contracture. Many women are familiar with the idea after cosmetic breast enhancement that the breast implants can seem to get hard. That can happen in breast reconstruction as well. Well, the capsular contracture, a capsule is a normal healing scar envelope that forms around the implant uh, in the healing process. For most women, it stays where you put it. About 10% of women, the scar envelope will shrink, and as it shrinks, it squeezes on the implant and makes it feel hard. It isn't the implant that's hard. It is a sh shrunken scar envelope. We really don't know why this occurs. It can happen immediately. It can happen on one side and not the other. It can happen 20 years later and nobody knows why. Uh, and it comes in degrees of firmness, anywhere from as hard as an orange to so soft that you can't even detect the implant. And somewhere in between, uh, there's all sorts of degrees of capsule contraction. There's nothing that this is going to do to her health, although an occasional person will have pain re uh, secondary to the capsule contracture, but it's not going to compromise her health so that reoperation for capsular contracture is an attempt to improve the, the cosmetic result, to look or feel better. I went back um, a couple weeks after and we slowly expanded it like a balloon and just slowly stretched out um, the area um, that we needed to and um, it was relatively painless. Um, it was quick to see the results and I, I thought it, w it was a great experience. Breast implants and tissue expanders represent the most common method of breast reconstruction used today. The tissue expansion process so far has been much easier than I had anticipated. I had read on the internet and in speaking with various individuals who had had the procedure that it would be much more difficult than I had anticipated. And so far I'm happy with where we're at in the process. I'm not experiencing any pain. Um, the expansions have been flawless. Breast implant-based reconstruction can be very helpful to match a small to moderate-sized breast. However, on occasion, a woman with a larger breast will request an implant-based reconstruction because of the simplicity of this operation. Let's look at an example. This patient has a somewhat larger breast. She selected a tissue expander implant reconstruction because she wanted a short, simple operation. In the operating room, she underwent a mastectomy, followed by immediate placement of a tissue expander. She was expanded, and then later we went back to the operating room, where a saline implant was placed, and nipple areola reconstruction was later performed. As you can see, because the left breast shows some cupping, it does not precisely match her right reconstructed breast. However, for her, it provided the volume she wanted, and in a bra, she felt balanced and symmetric. She chose this method because it was a simple, straightforward way to do breast reconstruction. As this presentation goes along, you'll learn that there are advantages and disadvantages to every decision we make in breast reconstruction. As in life, there are pros and cons to every decision that we make. Implant reconstruction offers significant advantages to the woman who wants a short, simple operation. Implant reconstruction offers very real advantages for the woman who wants a simple surgery. 
short operative time with little or no hospital stay. There is no donor site scar or potential problem at a distant site. Patients rarely need blood transfusion after this type of reconstruction. There are almost unlimited sizes. There are different shapes, types, and fills available. And breast implants are replaceable and removable. However, there are certain disadvantages to consider. Breast implants are a foreign material. We must consider the possibility of infection, extrusion, or migration. The implant cannot be molded or shaped to match the other breast. It may not feel like flesh, and capsular contracture can occur. In addition, the implant reconstruction may not match the other breast. Implants can leak. Future operations are likely. Implants have a poor tolerance to radiation. Special surveillance is necessary. And for some women, the idea of a silicone implant can raise their anxiety level. I chose the expander because I didn't feel like I wanted to go through a, a major surgery and having the tissue expander would not uh, um, scar me as much over my body as the procedure you were describing, um, taking the flap from the back. Um, and I wanted, you know, just the minimum uh, amount of uh, surgeries. Before we move on to the next option in breast reconstruction, I'd like to spend a few minutes to give my personal views on breast implants. In my opinion, in the past few years, there has been a lot of undeserved negative press about breast implants. I think breast implants are a very valuable tool for the woman interested in breast reconstruction. I use breast implants to reconstruct the breast removed for breast cancer. I will often also use a breast implant for the opposite or contralateral breast. Now it's certainly true that there are pros and cons to the use of breast implants and the same pros and cons apply to a woman who wants cosmetic breast augmentation as the woman who wants breast reconstruction. There are advantages and disadvantages. That's the first type of breast reconstruction available, implants and tissue expanders. It's what we call device-based breast reconstruction. I wanted to fill, you know, natural uh, hole, and uh, I knew I wouldn't feel that way if I didn't have reconstruction. Let's go on to our second major type of breast reconstruction, the latissimus flap. I find that the most versatile technique in breast reconstruction today, and the one I use most frequently in my personal practice, is the use of a portion of the latissimus dorsi muscle and skin combined with a tissue expander followed by a breast implant. The latissimus muscle can be transposed forward to the breast area to provide excellent skin coverage and some volume. It can also be transposed over a breast implant for the woman who needs more volume. Let's look at a patient example. This woman underwent a mastectomy about one year prior to being seen. She underwent a latissimus reconstruction over a breast implant, as shown here. About three months later, she underwent nipple areola reconstruction. I reached the decision to have a latissimus flap um, procedure because I wanted a procedure that wasn't as extensive as other procedures. We were very concerned as we started moving away from implants alone to moving muscle and, and soft tissue into the breast. We were not concerned with the advantages we had in the breast, but we were concerned, as you've asked, with whether disadvantages created either by the scar from the donor area or by the functional disability. So with the latissimus in the, in the mid to late 70s, I was at Johns Hopkins and Dr. Kendall was the world expert on muscle testing. She had written the book for physical therapists on how to test and evaluate muscles. And so we looked very carefully and studied patients with her with regard to the latissimus donor site. And interestingly, what we found, despite the fact that the latissimus is a fairly large muscle, is that other muscles in the shoulder back area compensated and there were there was almost no functional disability that could be measured from moving the latissimus from the back to the front, with one exception. And that exception is if the arm is moved behind the person's back and attempting to push inward. So it's called adducting with the arm in the dorsal or posterior position. So that's a very uncommon movement. So unless a, unless a, a woman is um, a world-class swimmer, for example, 
uh, there's virtually no disability from that. Uh, frozen shoulder is not an issue. Um, it really is a minimal donor site concern with regard to strength, and that's important for women to know. The scar, of course, can be designed and placed in a way uh, that can be covered with clothing, bras, bathing suits. Uh, so overall, that's a, that particular technique is one of our most versatile, safest, most reliable, with minimal donor site dysfunction, and a small to longer scar depending on the needs for the particular reconstructive situation. Dr. Maxwell mentioned that the latissimus dorsi method of breast reconstruction is very versatile. Let's look at a patient example. This woman underwent bilateral mastectomies and bilateral latissimus dorsi reconstruction. She came back to the office about seven years later requesting an increase in size and hence bilateral breast implants were placed under the latissimus flaps. She is demonstrating her donor site scars from the latissimus donor site about seven years after her operation. There was no limitation in her function. As described by Dr. Pat Maxwell, the latissimus dorsi flap offers a very versatile, reliable way of breast reconstruction. As we've discussed, one of the downsides to the latissimus dorsi method of breast reconstruction is the scar that is left on the back. There are different ways that the latissimus skin paddle can be designed. Here's a woman seen about 15 years following a latissimus breast reconstruction. Her scar was oriented in a different fashion and they tend to fade quite well. The major advantage of the latissimus flap is its high degree of reliability. It's going to survive in just about everybody. There will be no blood flow related complications as there can be with some other types of techniques. And as such, it's just a great mound of tissue to use to bring around to soften the mastectomy defect. So you can liken it to the situation where without the latissimus flap, sometimes the implant can look like an orange placed underneath a piece of Kleenex. You can see the outline of the orange extremely well. But if you take a thick comforter and place it over that orange, the contours are going to be blunted. It's the same way with the breast reconstruction. If we take that latissimus flap, bring it to the mastectomy defect, we're taking that comforter and we're placing it within that tissue so that the implant just generally provides some volume and it can create very pretty breasts. The downside is that you end up with a scar on your back. In my hands, that's an acceptable trade-off because we're able to create such pretty breasts by bringing that tissue around to the front. As we've said before, each of these decisions have pros and cons, advantages and disadvantages. Latissimus dorsi advantages include it is a reliable, dependable flap, no additional hospital stay is needed, it is a relatively short operation, it introduces new skin and healthy muscle to the field, it may match a small to moderate breast size by itself, it allows for some cupping or ptosis to provide a more natural appearance, and it also provides a reliable coverage if an implant is needed. However, there is a donor site scar on the back which is permanent and visible. In cases where we are trying to match a larger breast, an implant may be needed. A fluid collection or seroma at the donor site is common, and limited shoulder motion is temporarily seen. Let's go on to the third common method of breast reconstruction, the abdominal flap. I chose the tram flap reconstruction method, um, hands down, that was the one that, that was, I felt, fit my needs the best. The abdominal or tram flap is a method whereby tissue is taken from the abdomen, skin, and the underlying fat and transposed up to the chest wall area to reconstruct the breast. There are many ways this can be accomplished. The pedicle flap is a method whereby a very small piece of muscle is left attached to the body and the flap and provides for vascularity for the tissue as it is transposed to the breast area. Transflap is great. It's your own tissue, it's your own flesh. You don't have to have anything foreign stuck in your body. So you know what's there. Let's look at a patient example. This woman underwent delayed reconstruction with a pedicle tram flap. As shown, she underwent a mastectomy about a year prior. 
she has some redundant abdominal tissue. This redundant abdominal tissue was used to reconstruct her breast mound, and it remained attached to a small piece of the rectus muscle. She's shown about six months later. She has a permanent visible scar in her abdomen, however, she does have improvement in her abdominal contour. Let's look at a patient example of a woman who underwent bilateral immediate reconstruction with abdominal tram flaps. She was seen in the plastic surgeon's office to discuss her options, and as noted, she has some redundant abdominal tissue. A bilateral skin sparing mastectomy is planned for her with immediate bilateral abdominal flap reconstruction. She's shown about eight months later. Nipple areola reconstruction is planned. And as you can see, she gets a significant improvement in her abdominal contour. I actually like it, um, how it looks now, because it's flat. Mm -hmm. And um, it, gives, it gives me a nice shape when I wear a dress, it's and I'm flat down here. The advantages to abdominal tram flap reconstruction includes it's the use of a woman's own tissue. With time, the flap develops texture and a natural cupping or ptosis. There are psychological advantages for some women. There is no foreign body in the breast, no risk of capsule contracture or infection around the implant. The flap will change size as the patient gains or loses weight. And a woman may have improvement in her abdominal contour. However, the abdominal flap is a more complicated surgery and it requires a surgical team. There is a longer operative time and a longer hospital stay. Blood transfusion is sometimes needed. It's possible to have flap loss, either partial or total. Fat necrosis can occur. There's a possibility of abdominal weakness. And there's a possible need for a prosthetic mesh or Marlex in the abdomen. I think it's important to discuss this concept of abdominal wall weakness following abdominal flap breast reconstruction. Some women might believe that it means they won't be able to move properly or do a sit up after their operation or in some way limit their activities. In my experience, that's not true. After abdominal flap breast reconstruction, I expect women to resume their normal activities within about two months following the operation. If the patient's motivated, they do excellent. The only dysfunction really is the beginning of a sit-up. That first motion of a sit-up when you go from supine to up, that's the weakness. So there are specific um, mini crunch exercises and exercises for the abdomen that have to do with the external obliques and other muscles that if, if people get on that program in their recovery, then they have very strong abdomens. So for single pedicle tram flaps, there is very little abdominal weakness. The surgery has not limited me in any sense. Um, I do Pilates every day to keep my core very strong. I think that it's important with this surgery that you keep all the muscles in your core strong because they'll compensate for whatever muscle uh, you've lost. And um, it's forced me to, to be in better shape than I was before. If a woman can do a sit-up before the abdominal flap breast reconstruction, it's likely that she'll be able to do a sit-up afterwards. I find sometimes you may get a little tighter in the shoulder from playing golf um, multiple days, but I've talked to other players that have as many aches and pains as I do, so it hasn't really stopped me from doing anything. What we can see, however, is the type of abdominal wall weakness where there is a small bulge at the site where the flap was taken. In my experience, this can occur regardless of the method chosen to transpose the abdominal tissue, whether it's by a pedicle flap, a muscle sparing flap, or with microsurgery. I think it is true that the less muscle taken with the flap, the less likely a woman is to develop a bulge. And the heavier a woman is, the more likely she may develop a bulge at that donor site. Let's look at a patient example of a woman who developed an abdominal wall weakness after the abdominal flap breast reconstruction. As we can see, she developed a small bulge in the abdomen. This was later repaired by the plastic surgeon and the general surgeon in the operating room. Her abdominal contour was restored.
As I said, there are many ways to transpose the abdominal tissue up to the breast area. We discussed the pedicle flap whereby the tissue remained attached to the body by the muscle. Microsurgery is another way that we can transpose the tissue up to the chest wall. There are many ways to do microsurgery. Supercharging is a way that we reinforce and augment the blood supply to the flap by leaving it attached to the muscle and by hooking up blood vessels into the armpit. Another way is to totally detach the flap from the body and then hook the vessels back up again under the microscope. This is called free tissue transfer or free flap breast reconstruction. As shown here, in a free flap, the tissue is totally detached from the body, it is placed at the breast area, and the blood supply is restored by hooking up the vein and artery under the microscope. When plastic surgeons move tissue from one part of the body to another, that's a type of autotransplantation. That leads us to the term autogenous tissue reconstruction. In breast reconstruction, autogenous tissue reconstruction is when we use the abdominal tissue or the latissimus tissue to reconstruct the breast mound. I wanted this procedure and I liked the idea that it was going to be my own tissue. I wasn't daunted at all by the recovery period. Let's look at an example of a woman who underwent microsurgical breast reconstruction. This woman had delayed reconstruction with microsurgery using a modified DIEP flap. She had her mastectomy about a year prior. She's shown with operative markings. Again, the tissue for her breast reconstruction will come from her abdomen. For her reconstruction, the tissue was totally detached from the body and the blood supply was restored by hooking up the artery and the vein to vessels in the armpit. I'm very fortunate to be able to work with Dr. Doug Sunday. He's a terrific plastic surgeon, he's very dedicated to his patients, and he's a master microsurgeon. I asked him to discuss some of these newer methods of breast reconstruction involving microsurgery. There are so many different little technical options. It's very confusing to the patients. I think people talk about a free tram, they talk about a muscle sparing tram, they talk about a DIEP flap, and they talk about a um, superficial um, inferior epigastric artery flap. Um, and I think, at least when I talk to patients about it, I think in my mind, technically those are just very small technical variations about how the flap is transferred. And I think that it's hard for patients to determine exactly which one of those is right. I think sometimes they hear, you know, like everybody does, the newest buzz or the newest this. But in general, I think the real take-home point for microsurgery is that it's, it's a way to transfer a large amount of tissue and bring a large amount of blood flow to it. But it's a technically demanding procedure. Dr. Sunday and I are both fellowship-trained microsurgeons. We enjoy doing microsurgery, and we feel it's a very powerful tool in breast reconstruction. However, it's important to remember it's just that. It's one tool. Microsurgery is a technically demanding procedure, but for some women, it is the best option. It's important to remember that anytime we do microsurgery, there's a small but real possibility that the vessels that we hook up under the microscope can clot or thrombose, thereby leading to a potential flap problem. If that happens to a patient following microsurgical breast reconstruction, that requires a trip back to the operating room to restore the blood supply through the artery and the vein. It's for that reason that we use microsurgery prudently. Microsurgery, and particularly what they call the perforator flap in microsurgery, is our concord. In other words, it's our niftiest, sexiest way of doing breast reconstruction. But on the other hand, it's kind of inefficient in some ways because it takes up a lot of time, a lot of resources, and the question is, is it worth it? So in the United States, for example, probably 5% of breast reconstructions are done with microsurgery. Even though it's our niftiest, sexiest way of doing it, it's kind of impractical in a lot of places, in a lot of centers, and for a lot of patients. In summary, microsurgery allows us to augment or increase the blood supply to the tissue. 
It also allows us to take very little muscle from the abdomen and thereby protecting the abdominal wall. Free tram is when we used to take the whole muscle. Then muscle sparing was when we took just a little bit of muscle. Then DIEP flap where we take less muscle and, and on and on. And I think, I think people probably, in my view, some of the differences between those are not huge. But I think conceptually, one of the benefits of microsurgery is that we would take less muscle from your abdomen, which is a good thing to leave you with as much muscle as you can, than if we leave it attached to your body. I think there are three clear indications for microsurgery. One is when we need to augment or increase the blood supply to the abdominal tissue. Number two, when a woman requires extra special attention to protect the abdominal wall, and we can take less muscle when we do microsurgery. And three, in certain cases of bilateral breast reconstruction, we prefer to do microsurgical techniques. That's the first of the four major issues of breast reconstruction, the type of breast reconstruction. To review, there are three common methods, implants and tissue expanders, latissimus dorsi flaps, and abdominal flaps. Each of these methods has its own pros and cons. It's good to seek advice from other people and do your research, but you really have to look you know, within yourself and see what's right for you because there are so many different choices. Um, even if you decide to have reconstruction, then there's the choice, okay, you know, how do I want to do it? The tummy tuck, the shoulder, you know, the tissue expander, there's, and, and there's no right or wrong way. It's what's right for you. Before going on, it's important to remember, regardless of the method chosen, breast reconstruction will generally require revisions to achieve optimal results. Beauty versus blood supply describes that phenomena that limits a plastic surgeon and the amount of shaping and molding and tailoring we can do at one time. Oftentimes, we can shape and mold and tailor a tissue so much that its own blood supply is cut off. For that reason, breast reconstruction is often done in stages. We'll sometimes transpose tissue to the breast area and then allow it to heal there and then some months later go back to the operating room to mold and shape and tailor that tissue when the blood supply has improved. I'll oftentimes tell my patients that the first stage in breast reconstruction is merely moving the granite to the workshop. When we get that large block of granite to where we need it to be and get it settled in and healthy, then we can start to mold and shape it and tailor it. This is all done to respect the blood supply to the flap. I always use the expression, it's nice to have a second bite at the apple, because it, you, you, as the tissues heal and soften, and their positions sometimes change, and you can improve the result by, by maybe moving the scar a little bit, uh, doing a scar revision, changing the position of the, of the, of the flap a little bit, uh, or even with implant type reconstructions. Uh, you may want to take out a little more skin to shape it a little differently. The best results usually do involve multiple procedures. Let's look at a patient example. This woman underwent delayed breast reconstruction using the abdominal tram flap. As shown here, here are the operative markings. We see her a few weeks after her abdominal flap breast reconstruction. She has plenty of volume but she needs some reshaping. About three months later, we go back to the operating room. The breast reconstruction is revised as well as the donor site. She's shown about three months following her breast reconstruction revision or touch up. Let's look at another patient example. This woman was seen in my office some years following reconstruction with a silicone breast implant. The patient has significant asymmetry and the left breast implant has leaked. We went to the operating room, took out the silicone implant, and used her abdominal tissue to reconstruct the breast mound. As shown, she certainly has a lot of volume, however she needs some reshaping. About three months later, back in the operating room, we reshape the reconstructed breast and then reconstruct the nipple areola complex. Here's another case example where revisions or touch-up operations can result in acceptable symmetry. For a woman who undergoes a mastectomy, these techniques can be very valuable to create a sense of balance. Let's go on to the second important question or the second major issue for the woman interested in breast reconstruction. Number two, 
Does my breast on the other side need surgery? The reason why we offer the option of modifying the other breast uh, is because after reconstructive surgery, women want symmetry, they want harmony, and they want balance. Our next major issue is contralateral breast surgery. There are many different ways that we can affect the other side to help achieve symmetry, harmony, and a sense of balance. These include a breast reduction, a breast lift, or breast augmentation. Because one was larger than the other. So you had to go back in and make them even, and then I had one nipple pointing down and one up. Because they did, when they did mine, they did a um, breast lift on one side, and then the flap on the other side. So the other one was like down hill slope, and so they had to bring it up. So it looks much better. We can offer women a number of different options that affect the other breast to help bring symmetry. I think in, in my experience, about 75% of the women will want to achieve symmetry, and that can be achieved by either one of three means, augmenting, making it larger, reducing, making it smaller, or repositioning through a breast lift or mastopexy. We made the decision to uh, perform a breast lift on the other breast at the same time that uh, I went through the reconstruction. And I felt, again, that that was the best uh, process for me. I'm happy uh, that I did that because it gives me um, symmetry, um, kind of on the front end versus the back end. I pulled some cases from my cosmetic breast surgery file. Let's take a look at some of these options, augmentation, reduction, and mastopexy or breast lift. Breast augmentation is the use of an implant to make a breast fuller, rounder, bigger, and slightly higher. In a breast reduction, the nipple areola complex is elevated and the size of the breast is reduced. This case shows a different technique where a breast reduction was combined with a breast lift. A breast lift or mastopexy results in a higher breast with an elevated nipple areola complex. This illustrates mastopexy combined with augmentation. Let's look at a patient example where different techniques were used to provide harmony and symmetry following her mastectomy and breast reconstruction. This photo shows her biopsy site. She underwent mastectomy and abdominal flap reconstruction. About three months later, we went back to the operating room, not only to revise the reconstructed breast, but to lift the breast on the other side. About three months later, following revision of the reconstructed breast and lifting the right side, she's shown with reasonable symmetry. Here's another patient example of a woman who underwent breast reconstruction with the use of a tissue expander followed by an implant and augmentation on the other side. The biopsy site is shown here. She's seen by the plastic surgeon. She was taken to the operating room where she underwent a right mastectomy, placement of a tissue expander, and then later in the office underwent expansion. We went back to the operating room, removed the tissue expander, placed an implant, and augmented the other side. Later, we did nipple areola reconstruction. Again, she underwent mastectomy, reconstruction with a tissue expander followed by implant, and augmentation on the left side. What I find uh, is that there are two philosophies among women when it comes to their breasts. One is I have a matched pair, and one is I have two separate breasts, and it depends on who you're talking to. So for, some, for many women, symmetry is critical, and for other women, the attitude is don't touch my other breast, <laughs> and I, I respect that. You know, and I can I go with uh, what they choose. For the woman who undergoes a partial mastectomy or lumpectomy to treat her breast cancer, plastic surgery can also be very helpful. We offer techniques to operate on the affected breast as well as the opposite breast to restore a sense of harmony and symmetry. The lumpectomy and radiation can be a very nice option for women as long as you adhere to the goal of not deforming the breast. Unfortunately, for certain tumors and for certain women of various breast sizes, usually a larger breast, the deforming result that can occur after the removal of that block of tissue in the radiation can be significant. You can really lose the aesthetics of the breast. 
And that's where the plastic surgeon can really kind of come in and make that situation acceptable. Usually, you'll do some sort of a lift or reduction on the opposite side, and then you can rearrange the breast that's left in an imaginative way and affect some oftentimes really nice results, correcting the deformities caused by the lumpectomy and radiation. In the beginning, he asked me if I wanted to have it completely removed or my breast or just the lump taken out. And I didn't really know. And then after like a couple of days of thinking about it, I said, just take it all off. Just take the whole thing off because I don't want it there anymore. And he said, well, we'll do what's best. We'll look and see and see if we need to take the whole thing away or not. And why would you sometimes ask a plastic surgeon to get involved if a woman is having a lumpectomy? Well, there's two specific reasons. One would be to help fix the breast that was operated on to make it better and look normal again. Uh, the other is to fix the opposite breast, which might require surgery to make it symmetric. We sometimes combine plastic surgery procedures with a lumpectomy. So, for example, a woman with very large breasts might combine a breast reduction with a lumpectomy, thereby achieving even bigger margins around their cancer and at the same time achieving multiple goals. One of the things I'm very enthusiastic about is to match the breasts after you've done your cancer operation so that the side that had the cancer gets fixed and may be a little smaller and the other side may need to be lifted and reduced in size somewhat to match it perfectly and the outcomes can be very impressive to the patient. Let's look at a patient example. This woman was seen preoperatively by the plastic surgeon and the general or cancer surgeon. She was taken to the operating room where her breast cancer was removed and she underwent a mastopexy or a breast lift. With this type of combined approach, women can oftentimes have a more symmetric, balanced result. This woman had a partial mastectomy on the right. She came into the office with hopes of achieving better balance and symmetry. We lifted the left side, revised the right side, and reconstructed her nipple areola complex for improved symmetry. I feel it's important that women consider opposite breast surgery as well. Is that true in your practice? I think all of those things should be discussed during the first consultation because the planning of the reconstruction depends on what you're going to do with the opposite breast. My greatest fear was going into surgery and having my breast removed. However, I know cancer is first and foremost, but for me, it just wasn't an option not to have reconstruction at the time of my mastectomy. Let's go on to the third major issue in breast reconstruction, timing. We can offer a woman immediate breast reconstruction, that's when the operation is done at the time of the mastectomy, or in a delayed fashion, sometime in the future after a mastectomy. In my practice, this is perhaps the most difficult decision for a woman to make. I believe this is because there are true advantages and disadvantages for both options. Let's take a look in detail about immediate or delayed breast reconstruction. We'll go on to perhaps the most difficult decision for a woman to make. When will my breast reconstruction be started? The breast reconstruction process can be started at the time of the mastectomy. This is called immediate breast reconstruction or it can be started in the future. This is called a delayed breast reconstruction. After everything I'd gone through with the treatment of chemotherapy and surgery and radiation, I couldn't wait to have the tram flap. I've been very fortunate during my years of training to have had some excellent teachers. One of these teachers stands out in the field of breast reconstruction. That's Dr. Chandra Shaker at USC. Dr. Chandra Shaker is very dedicated to teaching He's dedicated to his patients, and perhaps most of all, he's a terrific plastic surgeon. I'm very grateful to Dr. Chandra Shaker for his support, encouragement, and advice during the making of this presentation. The decision for uh, immediate versus delayed reconstruction is a personal one. All other things being equal, immediate reconstruction has several advantages. One, it is one less surgery. Two, a woman does not have to wait an arbitrary period of time before she gets a breast reconstruction and she does not have to go through the psychological loss of a breast during this waiting period. And three, the complications or unexpected outcomes from delayed reconstruction 
are the same as immediate reconstruction. So unless there are very definite reasons for delaying the reconstruction, I advise my patients to have immediate reconstruction. Because I was strong enough to have both surgeries at once, I felt it was um, important for myself and maybe other wo women to consider it because when you wake up, you don't feel like you've lost a breast. You already have a breast intact and you have one covery to go through versus maybe waiting a year and another surgery. So basically, I was back playing my first nine holes of golf within two months. There are three scenarios where I would consider delaying the reconstruction. One, if a patient is not sure whether she wants to have reconstruction or not, and that's a big deal, and we have to listen to them. The second uh, scenario is where the patient may be getting radiation. If the tumor is large or if there are a number of lymph nodes which are positive for cancer in the axilla, then the patient may be a candidate for, for radiation and we may delay the reconstruction in that scenario. The third scenario for not doing reconstruction at this time is for medical problems. If a patient has hypertension or high blood pressure or cardiac problems which are uncontrolled or diabetes which, which is not controlled, these are all things which would make me pause and ask the patient to come back when these things are better controlled. The problems that a woman undergoes to with radiation are significant if they've had a reconstruction ahead of time because there could be a lot of swelling difficulties, even breakdown problems, particularly if there's an implant in place when we give them radiation. It's not a situation that I relish doing. Most women can probably have immediate re breast reconstruction because we don't tend to start chemotherapy for two to three weeks after surgery in general and by that time the wound healing process in a healthy woman should be proceeding nicely. In order to illustrate the differences between immediate and delayed breast reconstruction, I pulled two similar cases from my files. Both women underwent abdominal flap reconstruction. They are the same age, same ethnic origin. However, the first woman underwent immediate breast reconstruction. The second woman underwent delayed breast reconstruction. As we can see, this woman was seen in the office after the breast biopsy showed breast carcinoma. She is shown with some preoperative markings for abdominal flap immediate breast reconstruction. She's shown here after undergoing the breast reconstruction and undergoing later nipple areola reconstruction. In summary, this is an immediate breast reconstruction with the abdominal flap and nipple areola reconstruction. Now let's look at a woman who also underwent abdominal flap reconstruction, however in a delayed fashion. As we see here, she is seen in the office years following her mastectomy. She underwent abdominal flap breast reconstruction. Later we went back to the operating room to revise the breast reconstruction as well as the donor site and reconstruct the nipple reel complex. She is shown after delayed abdominal flap reconstruction and nipple areola reconstruction. For comparison, we see that the abdominal flap delayed reconstruction required revisions. However, the immediate breast reconstruction did not require revisions to achieve a certain symmetry or harmony. I think in terms of the psychological, that the, mo the best time to have the reconstruction is immediately. I never thought uh, six months ago that I would be as happy and as far along in the process as I am right now. So psychologically, um, that's, that there will be a, some of the same similar feelings in terms of um, being unhappy that they don't have their own breasts, but they don't go through that same kind of sense of not being whole again and that loss of their sense of themselves. Other investigators have demonstrated similar findings. All other issues being equal, it appears that women who undergo immediate breast reconstruction have less psychological distress than women who undergo delayed breast reconstruction. I just felt my breast and, or my reconstruction, and I was just, I was just elated. I was, I was elated. That just really, it really helped me. 
with my uh, daily process. Immediate breast reconstruction advantages include one less anesthetic, one less hospital stay, less psychological trauma, and almost always fewer touch-ups are needed. However, the disadvantages include doing the breast reconstruction at the time of the mastectomy can be a longer operation, it may increase the need for blood transfusion, it is difficult to schedule multiple surgeries at one time, a woman may not know her first choice for breast reconstruction, and post-operative radiation may interfere with the reconstruction process. There's a misconception about breast reconstruction that I like to try to correct. Some women in my office have told me that they've heard if they have breast reconstruction that for some reason they're at increased risk to develop a recurrence of breast cancer or a recurrent breast cancer will be more difficult to find. I spoke to Dr. Colleen McCarthy at the prestigious Sloan Kettering Institute about this issue. Based on our data, we feel comfortable saying that following implant or flap reconstruction of the breast, there's no increase in local recurrence of breast cancer. Again, based on our data, we feel comfortable telling women that there is no difficulty in detecting breast cancer recurrence following implant or flap reconstruction. Let's go on to the fourth major issue in breast reconstruction, later nipple areola reconstruction. Again, there are many different methods in which we can reconstruct the nipple areola complex. There's grafts, flaps, tattoos. However, they all have one characteristic in common. Typically, we do any of these methods in a delayed fashion. This woman is shown sometime following her breast mound reconstruction. We've outlined the area for the nipple areola reconstruction. A small skin graft is taken from her left lower abdomen where she already has a scar. This skin graft is transposed to her breast mound where we've already recreated a nipple using her own tissue. Well, we'll often delay the nipple reconstruction because we want the reconstructed breast to settle and we want it to soften and be at its end point before we match the nipple. And the problem is if you, and, and, and a lot of women in my practice I have to explain this to because they want it done at the same time, which is understandable, but uh, I, I, I tell them it's like it's trying to hit a moving target. If the breast is continuing to settle, we will put the nipple in the position, but you know, a year from now it may be even lower or in a different position. And once it's in an abnormal position, it's very difficult to correct. So I try to persuade most of my patients, and so far I've been pretty lucky, in persuading them to wait till the mound has settled before we do the nipple reconstruction. It is interesting to me that on occasion one of my patients will feel that nipple areola reconstruction is not needed or unnecessary. However, I find universally women are delighted to have their nipple areola reconstructed. They feel a sense of completion with this finishing touch. Choosing a method of nipple areola complex reconstruction is similar to choosing a type of breast reconstruction. There are many different methods available. There are flaps, grafts, and tattoos. A custom designed surgical approach is developed for each woman addressing her individual needs. This next chapter is called Special Topics. Some of you will want to know more about important issues such as bilateral breast reconstruction, chemotherapy and radiation therapy, prophylactic mastectomy, and skin sparing mastectomy. Let's start with bilateral breast reconstruction. At first, bilateral reconstruction may sound complicated and difficult to perform. However, it may be easier to obtain symmetry and a sense of balance. Again, we spoke with Dr. Chandra at the prestigious University of Southern California. At first glance, it might seem that it is more complicated to do bilateral breast reconstruction rather than just doing one side. However, you may not uh, realize that it is easier to get symmetry to do bilateral breast reconstruction, whether it be tissue expanders, latissimus flaps, or autogenous reconstruction in the form of tram flaps. It is easier to get symmetry doing a tissue expander on both sides rather than trying to do tissue expanders on one side and trying to match it with the normal breast on the other side. The same is true with latissimus flaps or autogenous reconstruction. However, with standard pedicle tram flaps on both sides, 
we are sacrificing two muscles or parts of two muscles on both sides of the abdomen and this may not be beneficial for the patient because it does increase the problems of abdominal wall weakness or herniation. So we caution patients about that. Each of the three major types of breast reconstruction we've discussed can be used for the patient who needs bilateral breast reconstruction. We can do tissue expanders and implants, we can do bilateral latissimus dorsi flaps, or we can do bilateral abdominal flaps. I decided to have the, the double, the bilateral mastectomies and I'm, I'm so glad that I did that. Mm -hmm. I think it, it was one of the best decisions I ever made. Let's look at some patient examples demonstrating each of the methods used for bilateral breast reconstruction. This woman underwent immediate bilateral placement of tissue expanders. In a similar way, she was filled up in the office and then later converted to permanent implants and then nipple areola reconstruction was then performed. Let's look at an example of latissimus dorsi reconstruction over tissue expanders in a patient needing bilateral breast reconstruction. She underwent the placement of tissue expanders under bilateral latissimus dorsi flaps. In the office, she underwent expansion. Later, these were converted to implants. During the expansion process, it was possible for her to wear her own clothing. I'm able to um, wear clothing and feel comfortable, sweaters. They move naturally, look natural, and very feminine. This woman underwent bilateral immediate breast reconstruction with abdominal flaps. Her biopsy sites are shown. She's had previous cesarean sections. She would like some improvement in her abdominal contour and she's shown with preoperative markings. She underwent abdominal flap reconstruction, later a flap revision, and then later nipple areola reconstruction was performed. She's shown about two years following her reconstruction. This again is immediate breast reconstruction bilaterally with abdominal tram flaps. There are other choices available for autogenous reconstruction in the bilateral scenario in that we can do microvascular surgery to reduce the amount of muscle taken from the abdomen. You'll recall that I said breast implants are best used for the woman with a small to moderate sized breast. However, in bilateral breast reconstruction, we can sometimes use even larger breast implants because then we can aim for symmetry and a sense of balance. Women don't seem to even notice that, that they're any different than a, a normal natural breast. Um, I'm very happy with the way they look. Let's discuss prophylactic or preventative mastectomy. Well, that's a mastectomy which is done when there actually is not yet a positive diagnosis of breast cancer. There may be suspicious changes, changes which are difficult to interpret, but there's not yet been an identifiable breast cancer. So you're removing what in other words, in other situation would be a quote unquote normal breast, uh, trying to prevent the development of an over breast cancer down the road. With the advent of BRCA testing, women can now more accurately assess their risk of developing breast cancer. Rachel Brandt is a genetic counselor outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. BRCA testing involves analyzing two genes, BRCA1 and BRCA2, looking for any abnormalities within those genes that may be associated with a cancer risk. It's very important to think about BRCA testing in a woman who may have a higher risk due to her personal history or her family history. The goal is to establish what her level of risk really is through genetics. I decided to have the genetic testing and we waited and waited for those results and it came back positive. A woman who's documented to have a BRCA1 or BRCA2 abnormality or mutation has up to about an 87% lifetime risk of breast cancer. Therefore, she will have options such as prophylactic mastectomy or chemo prevention that she may not choose if her risk can only be assessed to be about 30% based on family history alone. So being able to individualize her risk allows her to make more clear decisions about how she can reduce that risk. I think that our role as plastic surgeons is to try to make that decision that the patient makes to undergo this deforming procedure acceptable because we can then come in after the mastectomy is done and in many instances even improve upon 
the shape and the contour of the breast over what it was previously. And that allows these patients to make what can be this life-changing, life-saving decision. BRCA genetic testing can also help a woman assess her risk of future ovarian carcinoma. If necessary, oophorectomy or removal of the ovaries can also be done at the time of the mastectomy and breast reconstruction. I spoke with Dr. Stephanie Taylor, an expert in women's medicine, about this issue. It's not difficult to do the oophorectomy at the same time. In fact, it's preferred because it's in the woman's best interest not to have two separate anesthetics. And the way that we do it depends on the design of the breast, breast treatment. So if it's a mastectomy, we can do the oophorectomy through the laparoscope, which would leave her with just a few very small incisions. Or if she's having a major reconstruction and using part of the tissue of the abdomen, it can be done in an open way, and the surgery would be part of the overall reconstructive repair. So there'd be no increase in the number of surgical scars. Many of these women who had the reconstruction at the same time had a prophylactic mastectomy and immediate reconstruction on that side. So I have some experience talking with women and it did, it did seem the, they will be grappling with two things. They'll be, they'll be grappling with the experience and feelings about the cancer and they'll be grappling with that the reconstruction hasn't given them their real breast. But it still is less angst than to have to live with the absence of any breast tissue or any semblance of a breast. I see quite a number of patients who have breast cancer on one side and who are considering getting a prophylactic or preventive mastectomy on the opposite side because they don't want to bother getting repeated mammograms and following up with the doctor every six months. And so they're coming and telling me that they would rather have bilateral breast reconstruction. If a woman thinks she may want to pursue prophylactic mastectomy, she really needs to come to grips with that decision before she decides about her transplant surgery. Because a transplant can only be done once. So the tissue from your lower abdomen is harvested one time only, and we can either make one breast with that or two. So it's really critical for those women to make that decision prior to reconstruction. On the other hand, if a woman is considering implant reconstruction or latissimus dorsi reconstruction, those are things that we can do at any time, and it's not as essential for them to come to grips with that. After interviewing Dr. Collins, I went back to my office and reviewed my patient files to find an example. Here's an example of a woman who had an abdominal flap breast reconstruction on the right about 15 years ago after a mastectomy for carcinoma. This year, she developed a breast carcinoma on the left. I did this case with Dr. David Goldberg, a very accomplished and respected plastic surgeon. This year, she had the left breast reconstruction with the latissimus dorsi flap over an implant because 15 years ago, she already had the abdominal tram flap to reconstruct the right side. The beauty of my surgery was that it was a skin sparing mastectomy. So a lot of the skin around my nipple and, and uh, aurelia is still there. So I do have skin sensation. It seems that almost every woman who is diagnosed with breast cancer has a sort of dream or fantasy that there's somewhere she can go and get a general anesthetic, have her breast cancer be removed, and wake up and still have her breast intact. We haven't reached that point yet. However, with skin sparing mastectomy and immediate reconstruction techniques, we're beginning to become very close. Dr. Sunday and I are both very fortunate to be able to work with some excellent cancer and general surgeons here in Monterey. A skin sparing mastectomy is a complete mastectomy with the only difference in, is that the uh, skin, in, or skin envelope uh, surrounding the breast uh, is preserved. Uh, this allows the plastic surgeon um, the benefit of a more optimum situation for his breast reconstruction possibilities. There was fear at first um, that performing a skin sparing mastectomy would uh, uh, increase the risk of local recurrence. But many studies have looked at this very carefully and in fact uh, the, no increase in local recurrence can be detected over the conventional uh, modified radical mastectomy. A modified radical mastectomy involves taking the majority of the skin overlying the breast tissue. A skin sparing mastectomy involves making an incision around the areola 
and using this small round incision to gain access to the breast tissue inside. This gives us the advantage of leaving almost the entire skin overlying the breast gland. As shown here, the far majority of skin remains following skin sparing mastectomy and a small skin paddle replaces the nipple areola complex. This skin paddle can come from either the back when the latissimus flap is used or from the abdomen when the tram flap is used. To compare the results of these two different techniques, I pulled two case examples from my files to try to illustrate these points. These are two women of similar age, similar ethnic background. One had a skin sparing mastectomy with immediate breast reconstruction using the latissimus flap. One had delayed breast reconstruction after a modified radical mastectomy using a latissimus dorsi flap. Although they both have symmetry, the woman who had the skin sparing mastectomy with the immediate reconstruction has fewer scars. Not everyone actually is a candidate for skin sparing mastectomy. There are uh, situations in which um, the, uh, the surgeon may opt for um, removing the skin, overlying the breast cancer for a number of reasons. So uh, that individual decision really depends on the, the surgeon uh, and uh, his discussion with the patient and the plastic surgeon. A skin sparing mastectomy technique is only one way that the general surgeon and plastic surgeon can work together to optimize your final result. Other ways may include working together through a mastopexy or breast lift incision or a breast reduction approach whereby the scars tend to be minimal. This woman was seen after being diagnosed with right breast cancer. She underwent a right mastectomy through a mastopexy approach immediate breast reconstruction with a latissimus dorsi flap over a tissue expander, and a simultaneous breast lift on the left for symmetry. She is currently undergoing further tissue expansion. I know how she felt about her body at different times throughout this with the scarring and things that occurred, and it can affect a woman's mental attitude. And what I noticed out of this whole thing, it actually brought us closer. It brought out the love and the strength of our relationship of seeing somebody go through that. And uh, She's a beautiful woman and she's beautiful I on the inside this. and you made her beautiful <laughs> on the outside again as well. Another way to minimize scarring and still obtain valuable needed information is with the use of a sentinel node dissection. Uh, the sentinel node is the first lymph node that the cancer would spread to. So that is the lymph node that we want to get out and identify and see if there's cancer in it. Well, the sentinel node is an effective and safer way to get the information we need to know if the cancer has spread to the armpit. After the mastectomy, I went into radiation and had a series of radiation. And um, then after the radiation, I rested a while, let the skin repair itself after the radiation, and then I had the um, reconstruction procedure. For the woman who I'm confident or reasonably sure that they will have radiation therapy after their mastectomy, I, I give them two options, which I prefer. Either to delay the reconstruction until the mastectomy, chemotherapy, and radiation therapy are completed, or to simply place a tissue expander as a space holder that we will leave there, and then if radiation does not occur, we can proceed as if there was no radiation, obviously. And if radiation does occur, we can see how much damage there's been and maybe we can just do it with an implant, and on the other hand, maybe we would have to add a flap or even replace the tissue expander with the flap. Radiation therapy and breast reconstruction is a very difficult topic to discuss, primarily because there is wide variability in the way a woman's tissue responds to radiation, and because the way radiation therapy is administered varies greatly from center to center. Certainly, radiation therapy is being used with increased frequency in the treatment of breast cancer. Fortunately, in this county, we are able to work with radiation oncologists who understand that women can get radiation therapy and still want breast reconstruction. Radiation is a very focal means by which we can kill cancer cells. Where chemotherapy goes into the bloodstream and goes all over, radiation is by far the most potent focal form of treatment for cancer cells. Women who did not get radiation in the clinical trials after a lumpectomy had as much as a 40% chance of cancer recurring in the breast. The women in that same trial who got 
the radiation had less than a 10%, perhaps only a 5% chance of recurrence. So radiation was killing remaining cancer cells in a significant proportion of those patients. By far the best way to treat breast cancer is first remove it. If there's any cells left behind, we come back and sterilize those cells with radiation. We kill them. Now, radiation therapy, it doesn't make you sick. There's no nausea, no vomiting. And it doesn't make your hair come out. Um, those are some of the fears that women have about radiation. The side effects of radiation are really limited to the area that we treat. Radiation does have effects on normal tissue. And those effects are primarily a reduction in healing capacity afterwards. In other words, a person who gets radiation may have a harder time or slower time healing if a surgery is done in the area where the radiation was given. That's a serious concern if someone wants to have a good cosmetic result and undergo a reconstructive surgery after radiation. In women who require both mastectomy as well as radiation to the area where the breast had been in order to try to get rid of the cancer and hopefully never see it again, many of those women also want reconstruction. They want to rebuild the breast area so that they find that area pleasing, so it's symmetrical, they can uh, appear as they like, they can wear the clothes that they enjoy, they can go swimming and not be always thinking about, you know, you know what do I stick in my bra? Uh, for those women who choose reconstruction, um, they need to have their plastic surgeon talk directly with a radiation oncologist to coordinate the plan. Radiation therapy does not absolutely prevent a woman from having breast reconstruction. What it does for the surgeon is it makes the challenge greater. Uh, it means we have to be more creative in the solution. And it probably means the final result will not be quite as good as it would be if there were no radiation therapy. You as a plastic surgeon may encounter a lot of difficulties getting a patient to heal correctly after I've given radiation to their chest wall following a mastectomy. And it does require a lot of interaction between the plastic surgeon and me, the radiation oncologist, so that we determine what's best for this individual patient before we commit ourselves to any particular treatment, whether it be the surgery or the radiation. If we have that option, we should really explore it and look what's best for treating the cancer and then do the things that don't burn bridges to allow the patient to have that reconstruction she may want. In the patient who's already had radiation, more commonly we would use the latissimus flap or the abdominal flap with or without an implant if they needed it, and less commonly which is, would use just an implant alone. Individual reactions to radiation therapy can vary dramatically. No two women will have the same response to the same radiation therapy. Still, I think it's important to look at a few case examples. As we've discussed, this woman underwent simultaneous approach with the general surgeon and plastic surgeon to perform a mastopexy and remove the breast cancer. She went on to have radiation therapy. As you can see, there is some overlying skin change. However, she has maintained overall good symmetry and harmony. This woman underwent bilateral immediate breast reconstruction with tissue expanders. Later, silicone implants were placed and then nipple rilla reconstruction was performed. She also went on to have radiation therapy. This woman underwent a bilateral mastectomy, bilateral tram flap reconstruction, and radiation only on the left side because of the size of her tumor. She is shown three months after radiation to the left side only. She underwent modification of the right side for symmetry. We see her about one year following bilateral mastectomy, bilateral abdominal flap reconstruction, and radiation only to the left side, and then modification of the right side for balance. This woman underwent a mastectomy followed by radiation therapy. She came into the office about one year later wanting delayed breast reconstruction. We did microsurgery abdominal flap reconstruction, including resurfacing the tight radiated skin in her axilla. This case illustrates the potential effects of radiation to an abdominal tram flap. This woman was seen in the office preoperatively after a biopsy showed right-sided breast carcinoma. Because of the surprising result of the size of her tumor on the right, she underwent post-operative radiation. This photograph illustrates some of the post-radiation change following her mastectomy and abdominal flap reconstruction. Later, she underwent revision, nipple areola reconstruction, and we see her final result. Although there was some overlying skin change, 
She is certainly balanced and has a sense of symmetry in her bra and in her clothing. This woman's complicated case illustrates how difficult it can be to predict post-radiation change and how every woman's tissue reacts differently. She was seen in my office about 15 years following a lumpectomy and radiation for left-sided breast cancer. I saw her because of a new breast cancer on that same left side. She underwent bilateral mastectomy and bilateral abdominal flap reconstruction. Because the pathology report showed some cancer still remained, we went back to the operating room to remove additional tissue from the chest wall. She then underwent another treatment course of radiation therapy. She is shown about three years later. I'd like to offer a few words about radiation therapy before we move on to the next topic. First of all, more and more women are electing to have radiation therapy as part of the breast cancer treatment. The reason is simple. Radiation therapy kills cancer cells. However, it's also true that the tissue can sustain some damage that is left behind. As plastic surgeons, of course we want you to do whatever works best to eradicate the cancer from your body. Here's an important message to deliver. For the woman who has already had a mastectomy and has had radiation therapy, you are still eligible for breast reconstruction, even if it has been years following your mastectomy and radiation. It is more likely that we will use a flap method of your breast reconstruction. However, you can still have breast reconstruction after a mastectomy and radiation therapy, even if years have elapsed. For the woman who has not yet had her mastectomy, and she knows she will have radiation therapy, and she is interested in breast reconstruction, I think there are two good choices. Number one, have the mastectomy, go on to have your radiation therapy, and in the future, we can perform your breast reconstruction. The other acceptable route to take is the insertion of a tissue expander or implant at the time of the mastectomy. If this turns out to be an acceptable method to you, then we're one step ahead of the game. However, if there is difficulty healing or it turns out to be an unsatisfactory method of breast reconstruction, we can always convert to a different method. Many women who are diagnosed with breast cancer today will undergo chemotherapy. Women can still have breast reconstruction and undergo this important part of the cancer treatment. I had a series of rounds of chemotherapy. I started with chemo. Uh, went through three months, basically, of chemotherapy. And then I had my mastectomy right after chemo. Well, we know that cancer cells have DNA that's, that's abnormal. That's what makes them cancer cells. What most chemotherapy drugs do are attach themselves to the DNA in some form, damage it, so that the cancer cell cannot replicate and make new cells, but also it accelerates the death of the cancer cell because it's so damaged, and in that way killing off the cells. Because chemotherapy interferes with cells making new cells, it can also interfere with wound cells and skin cells and muscle cells making new, new cells and of course that would interfere with wound healing. But with current surgery techniques and in a healthy woman, that should not delay breast reconstruction very long at all. When I actually tell patients, because I often see them when they're still in the middle of deciding what to do, uh, is that all these things are trade-offs, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, mastectomy. They're all trade-offs trying to deal with the disease on the one hand and maintain your dignity and your body on the other hand. Uh, and that they should look at all of those options in context. Most women who are offered chemotherapy accept it, even though it's not a guarantee of cure of the disease. And most women who are offered radiation therapy, in my experience, accept it, even though, again, it's no guarantee. What it does is it statistically improves your odds a little bit. And so you have to balance that improvement in odds for the absolute certainty that there's going to be some damage to the tissues. This next chapter is called Complications. Complications can be a challenging subject for both the patient and the doctor to discuss. However, I think it is vital for the patient interested in breast reconstruction to learn something about the possible risks and complications to any method of breast reconstruction. You know, it was an ordeal to go through, but she, she feels very proud of the way she looks and uh, I think it just did wonders for her attitude after going through cancer and having to deal with what she dealt with. 
I believe that complications after any surgical procedure are fairly common. However, it's important to discuss the difference between minor complications and major complications. Minor complications, for example, are times when there are small wound separations or delayed wound healing. They tend to take care of themselves with time. Major complications require a trip back to the operating room for a significant procedure or a change in the overall strategy of the reconstruction. Fortunately, major complications are quite rare. We've discussed some specific examples of complications for each type of breast reconstruction. For example, with tissue expanders and implants, infection can occur and capsular contracture can occur. With latissimus flaps, permanent visible scars always result on the back and there's a possibility of seroma formation or accumulation of fluid. With the abdominal flap, regardless of the type of transposition, an abdominal weakness can occur. I firmly believe that selecting a board-certified plastic surgeon who is experienced in breast reconstruction at the outset can be a major step forward should a complication occur during the breast reconstruction process. Once she had that reconstruction, she could see herself coming back together in a sense, you know. Slow process, but well worth it. This next chapter is entitled Realistic Expectations and Imperfect Results. It is important to remember that no two women start alike and no two women will end alike. Every woman heals at a different pace, every woman's scars are different, and even though the same plastic surgeon does the same procedure on two different women, they will not have the same result. One of my patients, I think, taught me an invaluable lesson with that. Uh, she was having bilateral breast reconstruction using tissue expanders. And about midway through the expansion process, she came in one day and said, you did realize I wanted twins and not sisters. And I thought, what an epiphany, you know, because she realizes that there, there are shortcomings to this that we just don't have the ability to completely overcome. So what I try to convey to people is that, for example, 88% of women have some degree of breast or chest wall asymmetry before they had any surgery. Uh, and so I try to tell people asymmetry is common before surgery and it will almost certainly pre exist after surgery. And I use that term, I say, what I would like you to expect is that out of a breast reconstruction that you should expect sisters and not twins. And if we get sisters, I'll be really happy. If we get cousins, we'll both be disappointed. And they understand that. And I think the element of this is communication in terms that people can understand. I have seen many women in my office who were reluctant to ask for breast reconstruction, perhaps because they thought they were not the ideal size and shape. Regardless of your size and shape, if you are interested in breast reconstruction, almost always there is a method that is just right for you. Let's look at some examples of women who had breast reconstruction yet perhaps didn't fit the ideal mold. There is no such thing as a perfect breast. Most women have significant differences between the right and left side. I tell my cosmetic surgery patients the same thing I tell my breast reconstruction patients. The biggest single factor influencing your end surgical result is your size and shape preoperatively. Some women feel that they may be too slim or their breasts may be too small for breast reconstruction. However, for women with a small breast, an implant or latissimus flap alone can be very useful in breast reconstruction. Even large-breasted women or heavy women may be eligible for breast reconstruction. Here's an example of a woman who chose implant-based breast reconstruction even though she was aware she was not the ideal candidate. Even though she had a relatively mature-shaped breast that was large, she chose a tissue expander implant breast reconstruction because it offered her the advantage of no scars anywhere else on the body. It was a simple, straightforward, short operation and it gave her symmetry in her bra and in clothing. This woman's case emphasizes an important point. Every woman gets a custom designed surgical approach. As long as a woman understands the advantages and disadvantages of each approach, I think it is very important for her to be involved in the decision making process. We've shown many examples of abdominal flap reconstruction. 
We will oftentimes see women in the office who have previously undergone multiple abdominal operations and they have multiple abdominal scars. These women will likely have microsurgical abdominal flap reconstruction and of course they will still have scars in their abdomen following the breast reconstruction. Some women may have almost imperceptible scars two years later. Some women's scars stay red. And again, please remember, breast reconstruction can be considered to be a series of operations and not just one operation. The patients who get the best results in breast reconstruction typically have touch-up operations. This is especially true for women who have delayed breast reconstruction. Again, let's look at an example of a woman who had an immediate breast reconstruction with an abdominal tram flap. This shows a typical result with immediate breast reconstruction. However, let's compare two examples of delayed breast reconstruction with abdominal flaps. In both of these cases, these women underwent revisions and touch-ups to obtain their final result. In both cases, after revisions, symmetry and harmony is restored. Every month as I gradually improve myself, how I look, and it got me confidence and I got myself out there again. Up to this point, we've mainly discussed medical and surgical aspects of breast reconstruction. Of course, there are important psychological considerations as well. A patient's attitude, which has to do with comfort level and so forth, is one of the factors that is involved in the healing process. And so the better that attitude, the more positive that attitude can be, the, the faster the healing process and the better the outcome of the whole treatment thing. I mean, there's no question about that now. We know that. The experiments have been done, the evidence is in. She's a much different person today, she really is. Mm -hmm. Her self-esteem has grown. And, and I said two for one, I really have to say three for one, really. Because not only did she get, you know, the uh, tummy tuck, <laughs> yeah. she got a new breath, and then it got a little bit fuller, so that helped all the way with uh, self-esteem. They aren't alone, and I know so often in the beginning they feel very alone. Uh, one of the things I try to counsel women about, especially with a breast cancer diagnosis, that most of the time we have a week, maybe two or three, to make the decisions. It's important for women to understand once the breast cancer has been diagnosed that it's probably been there for years. And if they take even a few weeks to make a, de a, a decision about this very important thing, I think that's fine. You know, there was a great variation in terms of the age of the women that I interviewed. Uh, who had the reconstruction and uh, there was one woman in her 70s who was hesitant about coming in because she felt embarrassed saying it shouldn't matter to someone her age and it was striking that uh, the, in terms of that that someone's body and their uh, sexual being their feelings of being a woman age doesn't make a difference it matters of all ages, and that was something that, uh, what, what it came up was the embarrassment of this woman, as though she, she didn't want to tell her friends, she thought they would think she was foolish, that an, a woman as old as I am would want to have a reconstruction, but it had great meaning to her to be whole again. It's scary making the, the decision to have um, reconstructive surgery, but it's so worth what you get out of it. I'm stress-free. I know I'm not going to get breast cancer. Everything is back to normal and it really did not take long to bounce back. I have a, a sense of hope for other women that this surgery can help them to live normal lives. We understand this can be a difficult, frustrating time. As plastic surgeons, we take your emotional needs as seriously as we take your surgical concerns. Now we're going to take a few minutes to go over some of the more commonly asked questions. 
Dr. Morwood, what do you feel is the best type of reconstruction? Dina, actually, I am a firm believer that each woman deserves a custom-designed surgical plan. I don't think that there's one right answer for every woman. Now, understanding that, I can give you some guidelines of, in my office, how I counsel a woman about breast reconstruction. I think there are three factors we need to consider. Number one, the size of a woman's breast, or more accurately, the size of her intended or desired breast. Number two, what she wants. What does a woman want when she comes into my office? And number three, her medical condition. Now, if we go back to that first category, basing breast reconstruction on a woman's size, I think, can be very valuable. If we look at a woman's breast who is relatively small, I think an implant can do a, a very nice job and serve, it, serve her very well. Or a latissimus flap alone can oftentimes give a very nice reconstructed breast if it tends to be a smaller breast. For a breast that's of moderate size, I think tissue expander implant works very well, or a latissimus flap with a small implant. Now, if we move toward a larger breast, I think there's nothing really that can replace autogenous or natural tissue reconstruction. And that tissue is more commonly taken from the abdomen. Now, of course, the second factor I use in the office is what a woman wants. Let's say that for some reason she wants a simple, straightforward operation that leaves no additional scars anywhere else. Well, then we lean towards the tissue expander and implant option. If for some reason a woman really wants an improvement in her abdominal contour, we may lean towards the abdominal or tram flap reconstruction. And there are many categories in between. Now, thirdly, a woman's medical condition. I may get a note from her oncologist or medical doctor saying that we've got to keep her operation short and that's going to influence our decision. Or her oncologist could say whatever she needs, whatever she wants is okay. And that opens up many more choices. So again, in summary, I believe that a custom designed surgical approach should be developed for every woman. Do you think immediate or delayed reconstruction is best? Dina, in my practice, I think that's the most difficult decision for a woman to make. As you know, and as we've covered in this presentation, we can offer a woman immediate breast reconstruction. That means we do the breast reconstruction or start the breast reconstruction at the time of the mastectomy. Or we can do delayed breast reconstruction. Sometime in the future, after the mastectomy, we can start the reconstruction. I think there are true advantages and disadvantages to each decision. All other things being equal, I encourage a woman, if possible, to have immediate breast reconstruction. I think she'll get a better result more quickly with one less anesthetic if we start at the time of the mastectomy. However, if it seems to a woman that delayed breast reconstruction is the best option for her, well, that's fine because we commonly do delayed breast reconstruction uh, as well. It's very difficult for a woman to make that decision if she's going to get radiation therapy. And as you know, we've covered that issue in another part of this presentation. So again, there's pros and cons to each decision. And I think for a woman, she can make up her mind what's best for her, immediate or delayed re breast reconstruction. I think it's important, however, for viewers uh, to remember that if your mastectomy was done months ago or years ago, you're still eligible for breast reconstruction. I see women in my office about every week who for some reason thought that it was too long after their mastectomy for them to have breast reconstruction. That's not true. Even years later, we can still offer a woman many different types of breast reconstruction. Silicone breast implants were not always available in this country. Is that still true? Dina, actually that's a very interesting question. Silicone breast implants for a woman with cancer who wanted breast reconstruction have always been available. Uh, they need to enter into a study, which involves a lot of paperwork, but throughout this whole process of the FDA review, silicone breast implants for women who need breast reconstruction have never really been restricted. 
Currently, silicone implants are restricted for a woman who wants cosmetic or aesthetic breast surgery. Now, we're currently filming this in 2006, and that could change at any time, but the current status of silicone implants is that they are available for women who want breast reconstruction, and they're restricted for women who want cosmetic or aesthetic surgery. If I'm not satisfied with my breast reconstruction, what should I do? Well, Dina, you know, all plastic surgeons have women who are not satisfied with the results of their breast reconstruction. Certainly in my practice, the first thing I want a woman to do is to tell me. I want her feedback. I want to know if she's not happy with the size or the shape or the symmetry, because then we can sit down and talk about what her options are. And I think that's how most plastic surgeons think about it. We want feedback from our patients. We want to know how are you doing. Sometimes we need to talk about realistic expectations because as we've discussed, there's no perfect way to reconstruct a breast, but we can offer a woman many different options. If after discussing that with me or her own plastic surgeon, sometimes we encourage a woman to have a second opinion. If only to get an another perspective, if only to get another different approach that can oftentimes be, be valuable. But I tell women that with proper communication and realistic expectations and oftentimes, oftentimes doing touch-up or revisional surgery, I'd say the far majority of women can be satisfied with their breast reconstruction. So women cannot be afraid to speak up if they think something is, is not perfect. Dina, really, I, that's a great point. On the contrary, most plastic surgeons we want the feedback from a woman. We want to know how she's feeling about her body and her silhouette and how things are going. And I encourage women in my office and in my practice to spend time with my assistants or with me and tell us how they're doing. We want to know. How often do you affect the opposite breast during reconstruction? Dina, that's another uh, important point to talk about. As you know, when we reconstruct a breast after mastectomy, symmetry is really important to a lot of women. They're interested in balance and symmetry and harmony. So I think in my practice, about 60 to 70 to 75 percent of women will have something done to the opposite breast, whether that's a lift or a reduction or an augmentation. Uh, we offer the option of affecting the other breast. Now it's important to emphasize that it's not mandatory. If a woman is clear that she only wants the breast that has been removed to be reconstructed or get operated on, that's okay. But I'd say the majority of time in my practice will do something to the opposite breast, again, to bring harmony and symmetry and a sense of balance. And it goes back to that point about maybe not going under anesthesia one more time, maybe just getting thing, everything done at one time is beneficial in a lot of cases. We try to do as much as we can with every time we go to the operating room. Oftentimes, we will do touch-up or revisional surgery, but again, we try to do as much as we can during every operation. If a woman's been treated for breast cancer with a lumpectomy or with radiation and, and the breast is affected, it's a different size or looks differently than the other one, what can you do? Dina, you know, more frequently, women are being treated with lumpectomy or partial mastectomy and may have radiation or not afterwards. The plastic surgeon can still be very helpful in those situations. And sometimes a woman feels that only if she gets a mastectomy can she have plastic or reconstructive surgery. That's not true. We can oftentimes help in those situations when there's been just a partial mastectomy with or without radiation therapy by affecting that breast or oftentimes we can affect the other breast to bring, again, a sense of harmony and balance and symmetry. And it goes back again to women speaking up for what they want at the time. You can make everything maybe better than it was before. If we get feedback from women and they speak up, we can oftentimes be much more helpful and valuable than if she keeps what's going on in her mind to herself. Is there such a thing as being too old for breast reconstruction? Actually, Dina, some of my most grateful, uh, happiest patients have been the older woman who comes in for breast reconstruction. I don't think there's 
any age where a woman starts to lose interest in her sense of female identity or forgets about her silhouette. If a woman has quite a history of breast cancer in her family, at what point does she come to you to talk about a prophylactic or a preventative mastectomy? Dina, that's a good question, but it's a very difficult question to answer. Prophylactic or preventative mastectomy is somewhat controversial because it's never been clearly shown to save a woman's life if she has a prophylactic mastectomy. We're lucky that now we have what's called BRCA genetic testing, mm -hmm. whereby a woman can identify if she's carrying the gene that tends to run in families that makes her at very high risk to get breast cancer. Now, so that woman has a choice. Of course, she can have a prophylactic mastectomy if she's positive for that gene, or she can be closely followed and monitored with regular breast surveillance, such as mammograms and self-breast exams, seeing her doctor frequently, etc. There is, however, another time when I do encourage a woman to consider a prophylactic mastectomy. Let's say, for example, that she has a diagnosis of breast cancer in one breast, and we're going to go to the operating room anyway to do a mastectomy and breast reconstruction. She may consider a prophylactic mastectomy on the other side, particularly if she is BRCA positive. There are some cancers, for example, let's take lobular breast cancer. Let's say a woman has been diagnosed with lobular breast cancer in one breast, and she determines that she's a carrier of that BRCA genetic mutation, then she can have up to a 40 to 70% chance of getting carcinoma in that other breast. So it's an important factor for women to consider, and I always encourage a woman to sit down with her oncologist to help decide whether or not she should have a prophylactic or preventative mastectomy. She can sit down with her oncologist, and she should sit down with her general or cancer surgeon. I can help her decide about her reconstructive options, but I prefer and I recommend that she sit down with the real breast cancer experts. What's the relationship like between the plastic surgeon, the general surgeon, and the oncologist? Do we, are we confident that you're all talking and all on the same page? Well, Dina, you know, we're very lucky here in Monterey to have a breast center, and we have breast conferences and a breast team where we all get together at least every week and talk about the breast cancer cases. Mm -hmm. I think if a woman can avail herself to that type of breast center in her community, she'll be a lot better off because, as you know, there are many specialists involved today in the treatment of breast cancer. It's not just one doctor, and as those team members communicate, you, it's usually the woman that's helped and benefited. What can a woman do to expedite that if she doesn't have access to a breast center in her community? Well, I think she ought to encourage the members of her team to talk to each other. For example, let's say her oncologist and her breast cancer surgeon recommends that she have a lumpectomy, and she's interested in breast reconstruction, and they tell her that she ought to have breast radiation. I think the woman should speak up and ask the radiation oncologist to talk to the plastic surgeon and ask the plastic surgeon to, to talk to the cancer surgeon. In other words, she can help facilitate communication among her team members. And again, we're very lucky in this community and there are many other communities in the United States that have breast centers where that type of communication is encouraged and actually mandated. What do you want women to know before they come into your office for a consultation? Dina, I think it'd be helpful for women to understand the four major issues in breast reconstruction. Number one, the type of breast reconstruction. Number two, to consider affecting the other breast. Uh, number three, the timing of the breast reconstruction. And number four, I want her to know there's the option of delayed nipple or rilla reconstruction. So to have some familiarity with these issues I think is very valuable. And of course, then we can get started on developing a custom designed surgical plan just for her. Number two, I think she ought to get the okay from the oncologist or her internist and, and get assurance that she's healthy enough to have breast reconstruction. I think that's vital. Uh, 
I think that she should come prepared to have her questions answered. And I think most of all, it's great if a woman comes into the office having some idea of what she would like. Again, plastic surgeons like to know what's on a woman's mind. We want our patients to talk to us. So I think if a woman comes in with that type of prep preparation, it makes the consultation much more valuable. We're fortunate to have many valuable members as part of the breast cancer and reconstruction team. In this chapter, you'll meet some of them. We'll speak with an anesthesiologist, a physical and occupational therapist, some of our nurses, and many others involved in the care of a woman with breast cancer. I think a team approach is critical to all of the treatment decisions. There's so many things that interlace in the treatment course. So for example, um, if a woman, if we know a woman is going to have radiation after her reconstruction, it may modify the choices we make for her. And the only way we know that is by discussing with the general surgeon and the medical oncologist and the radiation oncologist and the pathologist the details of her case to help us understand it. Most breast cancer patients are now seen by, by multiple specialists, including the breast surgeon, the medical oncologist, the radiation oncologist. Well, part of that treatment planning should include the plastic surgeon so that the timing of the various interventions can all be agreed on together with all the members of the team and so the woman can make her choices based on a, a, a combined recommendation by all the people who are going to be involved in her treatment. We, we have a, on Tuesday mornings at 7 o'clock we all get up early and we take this team approach where there's pathologists, surgeons, plastic surgeons, radiation oncologists, medical oncologists, and all the breast care cases in the community are presented. We look at the slides, we look at the pathology, we discuss the surgical options, and, and we determine what is the best way to cure the patient. What is the best way to kill all the cancer cells and make sure that the patient has the strongest probability for a long and healthy life? talking to all the team members, which include the general surgeon, the plastic surgeon, the medical oncologist, and the radiation oncologist, I think will allow the patient the best choice of options and everyone will know the plan of action. It's a team effort between your physicians, your surgeons, yourself, your spouse, your family members. You have to rely on your support teams. You can't do it by yourself. Nobody does. One of the things we try to do is just encourage these gals to take a deep breath, and just sort of settle in and learn where their resources are so that they can have the conversations with the folks that can help coach them, help them interpret what the doctors are saying, uh, learn how it's going to impact their day-to-day -day life, and then they can make the best decision for themselves. There's a whole battery of people out there, a whole team of people out there that can sit down, they've got experience with this that can help you through that. Dr. Lipman is an anesthesiologist that takes your comfort level very seriously. We expect patients to be comfortable throughout the whole hospital stay, whether it's outpatient or inpatient, and I take it as a personal failure if a patient doesn't have that experience. First of all, I speak to the patient. I try to obey their concerns, give them a, a sense of confidence that the experience will be pleasant. I also give them preoperative medication, which, which has a tendency to sedate them and make them feel kind of mellow and feel comfortable before they get into the operating room, but it also has a a lingering post-operative effect which makes them feel comfortable when they wake up and allows the medication they'll get afterwards to work with the medication I gave before and they should be very comfortable afterwards. But afterwards uh, we, we, we've developed different modalities. We have epidurals and we have PCAs and we have uh, local infusion pumps. So three different techniques and they're similar in the sense they're continuous so, and, and uh, there's no time lag. In, in days gone by patients used to get some pain medicine and when the pain came back they would ask for it again. They would have these kind of gaps in pain control. Now the, the mechanism we use now is continuous. So there's no gaps, there's no peaks and valleys, there's a continuous infusion of pain medications. The patients are very comfortable. As a primary care woman's health care specialist, we're often the ones who make the diagnosis and counsel the patient about the diagnosis of breast cancer. After that, we work with the surgical specialists in designing a treatment plan. So, for example, reconstructive therapy would be planned with a plastic surgeon, but they would come to us and 
suggest doing the other parts of the procedure at the same time. Now, this involves a team approach and a spirit for a team approach to healthcare, which is definitely the best approach for the patient. It's, really, it's just like anything else in medicine. You should be responsible for your own health. And part of your own health requires some sort of check on a regular basis. The monthly self-exam by you and some professional who actually is seeing you in some capacity once a year. Many women following a mastectomy and breast reconstruction will be helped by a short course of occupational or physical therapy that helps them to get back to their full activities more quickly. I have had patients who actually have come in and wanted to go back to exercises and tennis and just normal activities early, uh, but uh, I think progressing them kind of at a gradual pace is probably a much more realistic goal. And I think at about 12 weeks they can start resuming more normal activities. It is of course understandable that many of you will be anxious when coming into the plastic surgeon's office for the first time. As part of the plastic surgery team, we want you to feel welcomed as you come into our office. We want you to know that all women are encouraged and welcomed to speak to us about breast reconstruction. We will do our best to give you the time and attention you need and deserve. Como parte del equipo de cirugía plástica, queremos que todas nuestras pacientes se sientan bienvenidas. Estamos aquí para discutir su caso y contestar todas sus preguntas. Trataremos de darles el tiempo y atención que se merecen. Many women have questions about insurance coverage and financial issues regarding breast reconstruction. Pre-authorization is an important process that we can help with before your surgery. It is taken care of ahead of time so that you are better prepared by knowing what your insurance will cover and what your financial obligations will be. I'd like you all to meet one more member of our team. This is LP, little professor. She works in the office. She meets every patient that comes in and she makes hospital rounds with me. A lot of the women find it very comforting after meeting LP in the office to see her in the hospital as she makes rounds. She's a very valuable member of the team. It's LP, little professor. For the thousands of women who will be diagnosed with breast cancer this year, we understand this is most likely a troubling and frustrating time. We hope this presentation has been valuable to you and will help you make some very difficult decisions that you're facing. After viewing this presentation, I think a good first step is to schedule a consultation with a board-certified plastic surgeon who is interested in breast reconstruction. A board-certified plastic surgeon can help guide you through this very difficult decision-making process and can formulate a custom-designed surgical plan just for you. In addition, we can refer you to other valuable resources such as the American Cancer Society and other breast cancer support groups. Thank you for watching this presentation. We hope you have found it valuable. I have been so fortunate during my plastic surgery training to have so many wonderful teachers. One of these teachers, Dr. John Gowen, stands out in my mind as not only an excellent plastic surgeon, a dedicated teacher, but a man who encouraged us to take good care of our patients. Dr. Gowen taught me a lot about facelifting, about other areas of cosmetic surgery, about care of the child, and about the breast reconstruction patient. He always reminded us to try to remember, surgical problems don't walk into the office by themselves. They're attached to people. People with feelings, with emotions, and a soul. It's for that reason that I dedicate this teaching DVD about breast reconstruction in loving memory to John Gowen. There are two referral sources that can help you find a board-certified plastic surgeon in your area who is skilled in breast reconstruction. The American Society for Plastic Surgery and the American Society for Aesthetic Plastic Surgery. The American Society for Plastic Surgery referral line is 1-888-4-PLASTIC. That's 1-888-475-2784. On the World Wide Web, that's PlasticSurgery.org. The American Society for Aesthetic Plastic Surgery has a referral line as well. That's 1-888-ASAPS-11.
on the World Wide Web. That's surgery.org. This project began as a presentation to breast cancer support groups in our community. I noticed that women were in need of accurate information about some of the most important decisions they would make in their lives. Routinely, they wanted to see actual before and after photos, they wanted to speak with other patients who have gone through these operations, and many wanted second opinions. I learned that the initial consultation about breast reconstruction can be overwhelming. My office staff and I searched for an answer that would allow women to view this material in the privacy and comfort of their own homes. Hence, the idea for this DVD was born. I personally made a commitment to this project some years ago. I firmly believe that when women are provided with accurate information about their options for breast reconstruction, they will be more likely to get mammograms, to report breast lumps to their doctor, and they will be much more likely to be able to deal comfortably with the news that they need a mastectomy or a lumpectomy. It is my personal goal to provide women with accurate information about breast reconstruction, attempting to correct many of the many misconceptions that somehow women have been led to believe. I've been asked on more than one occasion why a plastic surgeon is so concerned with the breast cancer patient. Over the years, I've learned that many women have a difficult time reporting a breast lump to their doctor or even to get routine screening mammograms. Basically, they're afraid of what might follow or what might be diagnosed, which could lead to the loss of a breast or significant deformity. It's my sincere belief and my hope that when all women realize that breast reconstruction is available, they'll be much more likely to get screening mammograms it will be much easier for them to report a breast lump to their doctor or to even undergo a lumpectomy or a mastectomy because they're aware that their sense of harmony and balance and symmetry, their sense of feeling whole, can be restored. I truly believe in breast reconstruction. A great deal of time and energy has been put into this project and I'm grateful to all those who have contributed and participated. Producing this DVD has been a huge learning experience for me. My patients and colleagues alike have taught me many priceless lessons. I hope this presentation is as valuable to you as it has been for me. And please remember, you're not alone. We are with you every step of the way.